I'm Adam. And I'm Duke. And this, and this is, is Where, where there's, there's a Williams, Williams there's, there's a Way. Hey, Duke, have you ever had a blessing? Sure, all the time. Really? Oh, sure, almost every time that I sneeze. You know, blessings are one of those things that people say but don't really think too much about what it means. It's saying grace before a meal or asking for God's protection or favor. Yes, but then they're also a beneficial thing for which one is grateful, something that brings well-being. You sound like a dictionary. Probably because I just read one. In today's book, Oscar is a book that has come to America to escape Nazi Germany. Upon his arrival, it is both Christmas Eve and the seventh day of Hanukkah. During his long walk to meet his aunt, Oscar encounters eight blessings of the last kind we talked about. I'm grateful that I didn't have to walk across New York City on a cold winter day. I doubt that's one of them. Let's get started. Oscar and the Eight Blessings by Richard Simon and Tanya Simon. Illustrated by Mark Siegel. Oscar's mother and father believed in the power of blessings. So did Oscar until the night of broken glass. His parents put him on a ship to America. He had nothing but an address and a photo of a woman he didn't know. It's your end, Esther. And his father's last words to him. Oscar, even in bad times, people can be God. You have to look for the blessings. Oscar arrived in New York on the seventh day of Hanukkah. It was also Christmas Eve. He knew his Aunt Esther would be lighting the menorah at sunset. To reach her before the sun went down, Oscar would have to walk over a hundred blocks on the avenue called Broadway. The city was terribly big, Oscar was terribly small, and Broadway stretched before him like a river. Oscar was already tired, hungry, and cold. His father's last words to him felt very far away. After a few blocks, he looked up to see a woman feeding pigeons. He offered him a piece of stale roll so he could feed them too. Oscar wanted to feed the birds, but he was too hungry not to swallow the morsel himself. The woman reached inside her coat and gave him a small loaf of bread. It was warm and fresh. It gave him the strength to keep walking. There it is, the first blessing. He got to see his first New York City pigeon. Nope, not quite. He met his first homeless lady? I don't think that she was homeless. And what is the blessing here? A stranger gave him food that helped him give strength for his long walk. I guess that makes sense. She fed him just like she was feeding the birds. Kind of, but the woman gave Oscar a warm loaf of bread that she probably intended on eating herself, not like the stale loaf that she was feeding the pigeons. Is it a good idea to be taking food from strangers? You should probably focus more on the act of kindness than anything else. He saw a newsstand full of comics. One showed a strongman in a cape doing amazing things. He stopped bullets, he stopped the trains. The newsstand man held out his hand. Oscar didn't have money, so he gave back the comic book. The man called to him. Keep it, kid. Merry Christmas. Oscar clutched his gift, his Superman, and he heard his father's words. You have to look for the blessings. Oscar kept walking. He stopped when he heard music coming from a little alley where a big man was humming a jazzy tune. The man whistled to Oscar. Oscar whistled back. They made a tune as fast and light as the snowflakes falling around them. It was Oscar's first conversation in America. At the corner of a park, boys were having a snowball fight. One boy slipped. Oscar leapt and caught him just as the Superman would have done. The boy was laughing and that made Oscar laugh. But when he looked at Oscar's cold hands, he stopped laughing. He took off his mittens. Oscar put them on and felt the boy's warmth. He had something to give the boy too. Boy oh boy, that one's a doozy. Getting a pair of warm gloves? I agree. When your hands are freezing, it is amazing. Like putting on a pair of socks that just come out of a dryer? No, not Oscar, the other boy. He got himself quite a blessing with that comic book. 
I grew up reading comic books, but I don't know if that was a fair trade. Heck no, it wasn't. If that kid still has his comic book in mint condition today, that thing would be worth eight million dollars. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. There's your eight blessings right there. Imagine what you could buy with all that money. A new house for the rest of your family to come to America and live in. And all the hats that you could ever imagine. Oh, you and your hats. A few blocks later, a tall lady in a big coat walked out of a building. A policeman shouted, Stand aside! Oscar stopped short. Oh, Thomas, he's just a child. The lady said to the policeman. Let him pass. She winked at Oscar. The policeman moved out of Oscar's path. Yes, Mrs. Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt? The sun was setting and Oscar began to run. He had to get to Aunt Esther's before she lit the shamash. Running, he stumbled and fell. A hand reached down and pulled him up. Back on your feet, son. His father was right. People can be good. He turned the corner and ran down the street looking for her house. He ran past a woman humming a nagundal. Suddenly he heard a name. Benyamin? It wasn't his name. It was his father's and it washed over him. She had a dimpled smile just like his. That's Papa, he said. I'm Oscar, whispered Aunt Esther. Did Oscar's aunt even know that he was coming? Probably. Then why didn't she pick him up? Sure doesn't strike you as a little weird that a kid gets sent across the world and has to walk through the largest city in the world at the time? It is certainly different than how things would be done today, but you have to keep in mind that this wasn't during a time when you got on an airplane that had a specific time scheduled to land. Sure, he was on a ship, but you'd think that there'd be a general idea for when he arrived. It took a ship around 40 to 90 days to come from Germany to Ellis Island. That's quite a range. Maybe his first blessing was arriving in the first place. He could be right there. I don't know if I'd like being on a ship for that long. Not unless it's a cruise ship. But speaking of liking things, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'm Adam. And I'm Duke. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Author's Note. When I was 10, my grandfather told me the story of the three rabbis who traveled from our family's village in Lithuania to New York in 1938 to ask him, the eldest son of the eldest son of their Rebbe, to return with them and take his rightful place as the new Rebbe. He politely declined. He stayed in Brooklyn and drove a New York City bus the rest of his working life. The rabbis returned home and perished in the Holocaust. I wondered about the three rabbis. What if they had stayed in New York? Why didn't they stay? Didn't they know what would happen? Did they know and go back anyway? I wondered about all the people whose lives were extinguished by the Holocaust. As a Jewish boy who had survived it by managing to be born half a generation after it, I imagined all the daring and sly ways I would have escaped the Nazis and how I would have outwitted them all, especially Hitler who always played the role of the devil in my imagination. Those fantasies were my consolation in the face of a horror I couldn't comprehend, even as I couldn't stop thinking about it. Oscar is the fruit of those fantasies. The idea that what needed to be saved was not just lives, but hope. I grew up on Long Island, close enough to Manhattan to visit, and just far enough for each visit to be special a trip to a land where wonder meets history. New York City, for me, has always been history itself, a place where you can feel yourself in history just by walking down the street. That's why Oscar escapes the nightmare of Nazi Germany and finds himself a part of history, not just because of what he lived through, but also because of what he can now hope to become. In 1938, the year the rabbis came to find my grandfather, the year of Kristallnacht, the year where this story is set, the last night of Hanukkah was also Christmas Eve. That morning, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, a fixture of humanist intent in a world seemingly gone mad, left New York City to fly back to Washington, D.C. 
the night before, Count Bassey and a host of other legends performed at Carnegie Hall in the groundbreaking From Spirituals to Swing concert. It was also the year Superman was born. Oscar's particular blessings are blessings that only a major cosmopolitan city can bestow on a refugee. They represent all our potential to survive and even thrive in the face of a great loss. In the words of Viktor Frankl, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Oscar has lost everything, or from his despair he awakens to his freedom, the choice to see the good in his new world. I like to think that this orientation of optimism is the key to our survival as individuals and as a species. It is how we, as American Jews, have made a place for ourselves beyond the shadow of darkness that tried to destroy us. Richard Simon, New York, 2014. Shamash, the ninth candle on the Hanukkah's menorah, usually standing above or below the other eight. It is the servant or helper candle because it is lit first and then used to light all the others. Nagundal, a nagun is a kind of Jewish religious music, a wordless melody usually sung with nonsense syllables. Nagundal is an affectionate way of saying it, a little nagun, Kristallnacht. On November 9, 1938, the Nazi governments of Germany and Austria authorized a pogrom, a violent mob attack on people from a particular ethnic group against all Jews, all synagogues, and all businesses owned by Jewish people in both countries. In two days, over a thousand synagogues were burned down, thousands of Jewish-owned businesses destroyed, and more than 30,000 Jews were thrown into concentration camps. Also called Pogrom Night, the Night of Broken Glass, it was the first wide-scale step in what was called the Final Solution, the Nazi plan to murder all the Jews of Europe. Did you know the three major branches of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, all have large theological seminaries in New York City. Not only are there more Orthodox rabbis in New York than anywhere else in the world, but New York City has the largest concentration of Jewish people in the world. <laughs>